Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. This morning, we'll have the pleasure of hearing a talk by Dr. Karen Foster Schubert. Dr. Foster Schubert did undergrad at Wellesley, majoring in biological sciences. She went to med school at Johns Hopkins before doing her residency in medicine at UCSF. Then she came here to Seattle to do a clinical and research fellowship in endocrinology here at UW. And she also got her master's in epidemiology here at UW, where she is now an associate professor of medicine based out of the VA. Over at the VA, she directs the endocrine section, and she's also the director of the weight loss center at the VA. She teaches frequently. She teaches MS2s in their endocrinology course, and she mentors a lot of fellows and residents in endocrinology. And she has a ton of ongoing research. So she has grant-funded research in adiposity, medical and surgical interventions for obesity. And she has many, many articles, book chapters, lectures on topics related to metabolism and obesity. And she has also won many awards for her research, including her recent election to Western Society for Clinical Investigation in 2012. Today, she's going to be giving her talk entitled State-of-the-Art Obesity Treatment in 2013. Welcome, Dr. Foster Schubert. And of ours and the endocrine division. For those of you who knew George Miriam, if you hadn't already heard, I'm really saddened to uh, inform you of his sudden and unexpected passing this past Thursday in a hiking accident on Mount Rainier. He was an avid outdoorsman and mountaineer, and he will be sorely missed uh, by all of us in the division, particularly his colleagues at the VA where he was based as the chair of research at the American Lakes Division. Uh, George was an active um, researcher in the field of pituitary and neuroendocrine, renowned uh, internationally, and was a absolutely valuable contributor to our clinical programs within the section. We will miss his infectious uh, smile and laughter, and our condolences go out to his wife, Suzanne, and daughter, Kelsey, uh, by whom he survived. So without further ado, let me jump into the topic today. I think uh, I would be surprised if anyone in this room wasn't aware that we've been in the midst of an obesity epidemic, as it's been called by most, um, certainly at least for the past two decades. These are some rather well-known maps of the United States. They're not political maps. Uh, they are actually showing self-reported rates of obesity by state. Uh, these are from the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey from the CDC. And the rates um, are depicted down here at the bottom. In 1990, most states had rates less than uh, 10 to 15 percent. By 2000, you can see those rates had increased. By 2010, the final state that had a rate less than 20, which was Colorado, finally fell to the red side. And I'm happy to say that although the map now looks better in 2012, the only reason for that is the CDC actually decided to make 35 the red category. And so we sort of ramped back the color change in the map. This doesn't unfortunately really reflect any improvement yet. Um, we all know that self-reported data, unfortunately, isn't always as accurate as the data from direct measurements. And the obesity rates uh, in our country is suggested by the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which entails direct measurement of height and weight. Uh, the most recent data published by Catherine Flegel and her group actually suggest that obesity rates for adult women are at 35.8% in 2010, which is the most recent published data, and at 35.5% uh, for men. These rates, although they've stabilized, and some are excited about the fact that they're not continuing to rise, unfortunately, I don't, I don't think we can pat ourselves on the back yet. But again, we have rates that have stabilized well over 35%. And this increase in obesity isn't just occurring here in the United States. It's actually happening worldwide in both developing and developed countries. These are data from uh, the World Health Organization and the Harvard uh, School of Public Health looking at over 191 countries, about 9 million individuals. These are data uh, uh, which have been uh, looked at directly from direct measures of weight, not just reported weight. And 
the changes from 1980 to 2008 would indicate globally that body mass index is increasing by nearly half a kilogram per meter squared, both for men and for women. Obesity, of course, is not just a cosmetic problem, a frustration that patients who deal with it uh, have difficulty fitting in the airplane seat or getting through the turnstile. This is really an issue that's associated with many comorbidities, as I'll talk about in a moment. And because of those, also an increase in all-cause mortality. This is kind of the classic J-shaped curve um, that you can see where the inflection point for mortality is right around a BMI of 22.5. Lower BMI is associated with higher uh, risk of mortality, likely due to smoking-related illnesses. But once you get above a BMI of 25, each 5 kilogram per meter squared increase in BMI is associated with a 30% overall mortality increase. So for a BMI individual with a BMI of 40 to 45, the median survival decreases about 8 to 10 years, which is comparable to the effects of smoking. The complications of obesity, as I've mentioned, really touch on every single system in the body. And notably, I've highlighted stroke and coronary artery disease, the vascular diseases, which are the major causes of death in this country, uh, for which obesity increases the risk of about threefold, diabetes, and numerous forms of cancer, among many other conditions. We've talked about this now on somewhat of a global level, and I want to bring this down to the individual patient level because most of all of us here are clinicians, and we're dealing with the individual patient who comes to see us in clinic. I practice at the VA, as was mentioned. This is a patient of mine I followed for a number of years. Mr. C, he's a 60-year-old gentleman who I followed in endocrine clinic for type 2 diabetes of about 10 years duration. He's actually done extremely well. Um, I wish all my patients did as well as he did. He started on an insulin pump about five years ago. He's maintained excellent control with hemoglobin and A1C levels in the 5.8 to 6.3 range. He does have all the associated dysmetabolic issues, including dyslipidemia, uh, sleep apnea. He has degenerative joint disease. He had a total knee replacement a few months ago. And despite the knee surgery, which he really hoped was going to help him get back on his feet and exercising, he really is finding that the pain is keeping him from being able to do so. His weight's been continuing to climb, now up to 272 pounds, body mass index of 38. And he struggles and says, you know, I've always been heavy. And and all of his siblings are sort of in the same boat. But if anything, he feels like he's doing better than they are. He really is careful about his diet to the degree that I can trust his self-report. I certainly know he's managed very carefully what he eats because of his diabetes. And he keeps asking me, what else can I do to lose this weight? So with that, um, let me tell you how we're going to approach the topic of obesity treatment in 2013. I'll start off just briefly addressing issues relating to screening and what the current treatment guidelines are. We'll talk about lifestyle intervention, which is really considered the cornerstone of obesity therapy, diet, exercise, behavior modification, which is also known as the stuff that we all know we're supposed to do. And then we'll go into pharmacotherapy. There have been a couple of new medications approved just in 2012, some of them only just now coming to market uh, this past summer. Is there a new hope for us in 2013? And then I'll finally finish talking about bariatric surgery, which really now most people in the field are saying should be considered bariatric and metabolic surgery, and we'll talk about why. So one of the key things in screening for obesity is simply recognizing, first of all, that it is a disease, and it should actually be included on the patient's problem list. Unfortunately, as recently as 2007, a series in a primary care clinic at the uh, Mayo Clinic found that as few as 20% of patients in the primary care clinic that were obese by BMI measures actually carried that as a diagnosis in their chart. And that was the biggest predictor of actually coming up with a plan for the patient to deal with their obesity. So if you don't diagnose it, you don't think about it. BMI should really be considered as a vital sign, as one of our vital signs that we gather when patients come in. It's on that sheet when you pull it out of the door when they come to see you in clinic. And that's really the only tool that we need to screen for obesity because we define it as such. A body mass index between 18.5 to 24.9 is considered normal weight. Overweight is a body mass index of 25 to up to 30. And then obese is considered a body mass index greater than 30. And again, there's discussion and argument about is this really the best measure we all know about those football player type of athletes who, you know, are really muscular that have these elevated BMIs that put them in that obese category. But certainly from an epidemiologic standpoint, this is probably the best predictor. And in addition, waist circumference is something that should also be considered. And we'll go over the things that we typically measure in clinic. But this, again, gives you a sense of what these categories are. Height corrected essentially for body surface area. 
So when we see patients in clinic, what are the initial things that we want to go over? The first, of course, is history and severity of obesity. Um, this is really a useful element, primarily if you're going to think about are there, you know, are there maybe some unusual underlying things that are going on here that may be treatable. So for example, if a patient tells you, you know, our weight has been normal uh, and just in the last year all of a sudden they've gained 80 pounds, something may be going on there. Um, not to say that it's necessarily an endocrine. But that might kind of tip you off versus the individuals sort of had the slow, relentless gain over time. And again, what those these things that you're thinking about is could there be sort of a we say a treatable cause, but more typically a contributory factor. And there's just a whole host of these potentially. Now, most of the patients that come in and see us in the body weight disorders uh, and obesity clinic at the VA or the endocrine clinic uh, aren't typically coming in with obesity on their problem list and ending up with a diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. But that is certainly something that we want to think about. And again, the history may point you in the direction of any of these, whether it be Cushing's, whether some degree of hypothyroidism might be contributing, um, hypothalamic syndromes, tumors that impact the body weight control centers in the brain. Um, and again, certainly if you find out that a patient has a history of being overweight or obese uh, far beyond that of their family members, it may trigger you to think about some of the rare um, what we call monogenic obesities, which are mutations typically in the leptin and leptin signaling pathways, and I'll talk more about those uh, a little bit later. What we more typically see is that patients are often coming in on medications that have really uh, contributed to their problems. Atypical antipsychotics can be quite high in that list. The therapies that we use for diabetes, insulin, sulfonylureas, and, and thiazolidine dions in particular, not all therapies, but these are ones that can be big problems, glucocorticoids. So these are all things that we want to look at and see, are there things that we can do to help mitigate the obesity problem beyond what may be going on anyway? And then again, we want to think about if we're looking at screening and we want to ultimately treat, what is the patient's risk? Uh, primarily, we tend to think about central adiposity, that's the apple versus the pear shape, as really being the most associated with metabolic disease and the comorbidities that come with that, and of course, the increased mortality. So what do the guidelines say? Who should I treat? Well, certainly anyone who has a body mass index over 30 that fits in the category of obesity. And the National Institutes of Health guidelines, which were initially published in 2000 and have been updated and are available on the NIH and NHLBI website, would also suggest that treating with a body mass index greater than 27 if they have one of the comorbidities that come along typically with obesity. And the caveat here is these BMI categories really fit for Caucasians, African Americans, Hispanics, perhaps most likely for Asian Americans, we need to actually consider a BMI of uh, greater than 27 as consistent with obesity and the 20, 23 to 27 range as consistent with overweight because of the increased risk of these individuals at lower adiposity. So what are the goals of weight loss? Of course, we want to reduce the prevalence of comorbid conditions, ideally reduce the severity if we can't get rid of the disease that is associated altogether, reduce mortality risk and improve quality of life. And to do all these things, how much weight loss is necessary? Most of our patients come in hoping to lose all of their excess weight by diet and exercise. And most of us know that unless you're on the reality shows such as extreme weight loss, that may be a little difficult to achieve uh, if you don't have your personal trainer living with you 24-7 and you give up your, your life for a year. Um, but the reassuring thing to tell patients, even though this may not be the goal that they're after, is that there are remarkable improvements in some of the metabolic associated issues with obesity with even a 5 to 10% weight loss. And there are you know, pages and pages of references that I could have included here. These are just some more recent ones looking at uh, weight loss leading to decreases in blood pressures, improvements in serum lipid profiles, improvement in glucose tolerance, and even uh, reduction in the incidence of new onset type 2 diabetes. So what are the actual therapy guidelines? How should we start approaching this? Well, the initial therapeutic approach, as I had initially alluded to, is lifestyle intervention. And that typically encompasses diet. Uh, and we'll go into a little bit about some of the diet data in a moment. Um, most typically what's recommended is a portion control diet and aiming to reduce calories by about 500 kilocalories per day, um, incorporating an exercise program with that. And then with all of this, of course, comes behavior modification. And again, the goal with this kind of an intervention is for the individual to achieve about a 5 to 10 percent weight loss over a 6 to 12 month period. So which diet should they follow? 
there are two really excellent studies that I just want to highlight uh, from the past roughly 10 years, and I think these really are the two still seminal studies in the field. The first was published by uh, Danzinger and all. They took a group of 160 patients all together, randomized 40 per group, uh, again, a completely randomized uh, fashion, to either uh, the Atkins in the far left zone, Weight Watchers, or Ornish diets, all of which have slightly different focus in terms of macronutrient composition, whether it's high fat, low fat, higher carb, higher protein, or more moderate uh, amounts of each. And what these graphs depict are uh, adherence to the study diets, which start off uh, at baseline. Apologies, I can't, there is the mouse. They start at baseline at about the same level for all of the diets around a six to seven self-rating when the, the maximum adherence would be a 10. And you can see they all fall off with about the same amount over time. Not surprisingly, the change in weight by the diet type was absolutely no different. That's the panel to the left. Um, so right here, this is uh, the zero, zero change. And you can just see right here, there's the weight loss line, which was uh, you know about a three kilogram weight change across the group. Lots of variety, lots of spread in the data, but absolutely no difference between study and the key factor here, of course, was again, mean dietary score over here with 10 being the best. And you can see there's a nice correlation with weight loss if you adhere to the diet. So everybody continued to sort of hem and haw and say, well, but you know, we really need to look at the macronutrient composition. This is really where the key is. Perhaps it is a higher protein, uh, maybe moderate fat diet that is, is the way to go. So this study is, again, probably the largest of its kind, is the largest of its kind uh, currently in the field uh, by um, Sachs and Bray and all published in the New England Journal now just a couple of years ago. And basically they looked at higher protein, which was uh, about, 25% uh, versus uh, lower versus high fat, 20% low fat, and 40% high fat. And then the amounts of carbohydrates, as you, you can see, varied. Uh, for those of you that can't quite see at the back, diet in the triangle is 65% fat, 15% protein, 20% fat, which is sort of a typical AHA diet, higher carb, low fat. And, and then it just progresses up from there. And this is the weight change across the study, which was a two-year study. You can see that everybody lost essentially the same amount at month six, had regained a little bit here at month 12. There's lots of discussion about whether these might actually be different. And again, the progression upwards, none of these diets were statistically different. 800 participants, over 40% in the study were men. They had 80% retention. So this really suggested that at least in a randomized fashion, you couldn't really find a difference between diet types. And again, the best predictor of weight loss was adherence to the diet. So I just wanted to make mention of, I think, a concept that is a very interesting one and may, may well be where the field of nutrition research is going. And I'll uh, tip my hat to some of my colleagues in this area, such as Mario Kratz at the, at the Hutch and others who are doing some really elegant physiologic studies in nutrition, trying to understand really is there could there be an optimal diet type for an individual potentially based on their, their genotype? And there are a number of studies going on that have looked at uh, genomic wide association type studies, looking at genes associated with metabolic risk and whether these may be impacted by different diet types. In particular, what's mostly been looked at is the impact of high fat diets uh, with particular genotypes in relation to improvement in metabolic parameters. Uh, weight loss hasn't really been looked at specifically yet, but I think this is an area of, of great interest. So again, what we tell patients at the end of the day, realistic goals, tailoring the diet, individual preferences. If a patient likes what they're eating, they really need to make these changes lifelong and be able to sustain them over the long term. So finding things that will really work for them, for their culture, working ideally with a good nutritionist who can help the busy primary care provider do this kind of counseling, because this does take time. And one of the key things, of course, is identifying those adherence barriers to the diets over the long term. So after the diet, what do we have next to add to this? Of course, physical activity. And I'm not really going to go into a lot of the data on exercise per se, other than just to highlight some key points um, about the role of physical activity in lifestyle change. It's quite clear that physical activity plays a protective role against weight gain over time, both in lean individuals as well as obese. So get your exercise program going now and stick with it. Good luck with that contributes to the success of hypocaloric diet-induced weight loss and also long-term maintenance. So we have data from a registry called the National Weight Control Registry. These are individuals who were defined as achieving at least a 10% weight loss and maintaining that for at least a year. 
and it has to be uh, documented by their physician for them to be entered in this registry. And what's found in these individuals who are considered successful lifestyle, uh, people who've successfully changed lifestyle and been able to maintain weight loss, that most of these individuals engage in an hour per day of aerobic type physical activity without fail. That includes Saturdays and Sundays. Metabolic benefits via changes in body composition. This is clearly one of the things that exercise brings uh, to diet-induced weight loss. Um, for example, in individuals who just diet, they probably lose a little bit more of their lean mass, not just their adipose tissue mass. And so incorporating an exercise component to their lifestyle program will help protect that lean mass. As a single intervention, unfortunately, though, it's not terribly effective by itself at causing substantial weight loss. But again, its roles are more important than all of the other things that I've highlighted. Behavior change. This is a very interesting area, I think, that is uh, rapidly uh, being updated even as we speak. Um, for those of you downloading some of your apps right now, um, we know that self-monitoring of these behavior changes uh, is associated with better outcomes, better adherence, uh, both in terms of the initial intervention and likely in uh, longer term for weight loss maintenance. And in a number of studies that have been published now, a couple in archives, I think one recently in JAMA by Rena Wing's group, um, there have been a number of these uh, smartphone-based applications that allow you to track and monitor your activity, your calorie intake. And when you track that kind of stuff and you're looking at your phone and saying, am I going to pick up this cookie and eat this now? Or, ooh, I better not because I'm already up to this many calories and I've had too much fat and sugar today already. We know that these things seem to help um, bring about behavior change. And so I think we'll see more and more studies looking at incorporating um, these kinds of devices into uh, their routines. So is it inevitable, though, that after we make all these efforts, those fat cells are just going to head right on back? The common conception is that lifestyle interventions fail, that patients lose weight, and then they regain it. The reality is probably about 20% of individuals who undertake these kinds of weight loss interventions are able to maintain at least some of that weight loss. I'm showing you data actually from a study uh, that I published in conjunction with Ann McTiernan at the Fred Hutch. This trial was uh, known as the Nutrition and Exercise for Women study. About 420 postmenopausal women who were randomly assigned to either exercise alone, diet alone, or the combination, as well as a control group whose data I'm not showing you right here. And we looked at uh, the outcome and was published uh, in, in obesity just last year to the 12-month mark. These are data that are not yet published, where we brought back most of these individuals 18 months following the intervention and weighed them and looked to see where their weights are. And you can see the trajectory, interestingly, for exercise was that they did not lose a whole lot of weight, as I'd already noted. This isn't really a great intervention for weight loss by itself, but the average is for them to continue to go down a little bit, again, assuming that they're maintaining these activities, and we have all this data, but not all quite analyzed in terms of these predictors yet. Um, for diet alone, there's a little bit of weight gain, same with diet and exercise, but the interesting thing is to look at the individual variability. You can see that there are still some people who continue to go down. Most of the individuals go up a little bit. Clearly, this speaks to an underlying physiology that is working to drive weight regain, but it's variable, and some of that, of course, is behavior as well as physiology. So the concept that I'm getting at here, the reason that this is so difficult is that body weight is regulated. It's regulated sort of like a classic endocrine feedback loop kind of system, whereby if you try to lose weight, there are changes that occur in proportion to that weight to drive the weight back up. Believe it or not, the same is true on the other end of the spectrum, although it's not as robust. And this concept of counter-regulation or that there are changes in appetite and metabolic rate, again, proportional to the changes in weight that work to maintain weight within that scent range. And this concept is known as energy homeostasis. It was purported that there would be signals that were coming from the periphery uh, as early as the 1950s that were communicating somehow with the brain to, to let our bodies know where this set point was and to, to defend this. And of course, it's now nearly 20 years ago. <sighs> that makes me feel old, um, that one of the key mediators of this system, leptin, which is the product of the OBOB -OB gene, this mouse on the right side here is deficient in leptin. It lacks the signaling molecule, and therefore it's obese to the degree that it weighs more than two of its littermates. And it was thought that this was going to be the answer. Individuals with obesity are just deficient uh, in leptin. The signals, signaling molecules such as leptin and insulin, again, circulate in proportion to body fat communicate with the brain, modulating both food intake and energy expenditure, 
physical activity metabolic rate to kind of maintain fat stores in a balance. This is uh, an older um, slide that uh, comes from a wonderful review by my Schwartz and colleagues in Nature, but really I think gives a nice, uh, very clear picture of this overall concept. Again, though, the problem with obesity is not that it's due to leptin deficiency. These are data from a colleague of mine, Scott Weigel, in the division, showing that individuals with increasing percent body fat have the appropriate increases in leptin. So the issue here is not so much leptin deficiency is, as it is analogous to insulin resistance and diabetes, it's, it's leptin resistance. The leptin signal is there, but for some reason it's not getting through. And I think we've had an absolute explosion of research in trying to understand what these underlying mechanisms are. There's complexities, both in terms of all of the signaling molecules that have been found beyond leptin uh, coming from the gut, um, element, elements such as uh, ghrelin, GLP-1, PYY, uh, which are coming from various sites uh, in the GI tract and communicating again with centers in the brain in conjunction with leptin and insulin. And these systems are present uh, both in terms of, of energy homeostasis and kind of regulating feeding, but even above and beyond that, there are centers in the brain, centers that are involved, for example, in addiction and reward, which are those factors that will even override these signals and tell us, for example, I can't eat that piece of pumpkin pie on Thanksgiving when I know I'm already stuffed. And so these systems are very complex, which I think underscores the difficulty, as we'll get to soon, with the pharmacotherapy. And again, hats off to many of my colleagues in this division, such as uh, Mike Schwartz, David Cummings, uh, Josh Taylor, and many others who've done some incredible research in understanding these circuitries. So one question is, if, if we have these changes that are occurring with lifestyle change, um, if we can just sustain the weight loss long enough, maybe these, maybe these signals will not persist. Maybe we'll reset sort of at a new point. And until just uh, recently in 2011, uh, no one had actually ever, ever looked at this. We've uh, gathered some of that data from the new trial, but haven't actually been able to measure all of the hormonal mediators as of yet. Uh, but this study just came out looking at a relatively short-term intervention in, in 50 individuals, a 10-week, uh, very low-calorie diet coupled with physical activity. They lost weight and then had sort of a slow degree of weight gain over time, followed out uh, to a year after the study. After the initial intervention, they just simply had advice on how to maintain their lifestyle changes, and they came into the study center to be weighed every couple of months. And these uh, investigators looked uh, at ghrelin, PYY, amylin, and CCK, among other elements. And as you can see, found that the changes that had occurred from baseline, which in all of these graphs is depicted in black, uh, to the end of the study intervention period, which was at 10 weeks, really for the most part persisted. Uh, they didn't go back to baseline. They didn't remain elevated, but they really changed in conjunction with the weight loss. So again, suggesting that these drivers don't reset uh, potentially until the individuals regained the weight that they've lost. So gosh, that makes it kind of tough to be successful at lifestyle change. What do we do now if an individual doesn't achieve that weight loss that they've desired by the six to 12 months with lifestyle change? Well, the guidelines say at this point we add pharmacotherapy. Up to last year, this was my slide saying, well, we've got about four medicines that are approved for short-term use in about 12 weeks. As soon as individuals stop these four drugs that are all in white at the top, the weight kind of comes right back. They're certainly associated with a number of issues, including cardiovascular ones such as tachycardia, hypertension, and things that we kind of worry about in, in obese patients. Uh, the only medication that we had uh, approved for long-term use was Orlistat, which is a GI lipase inhibitor. I'll talk about it a little bit more. It's also fraught with quite a number of unpleasant side effects uh, and has some efficacy, but certainly is not, uh, not that panacea for obesity therapy that we might be hoping for. Come 2012, however, we actually have a couple more agents available in our armamentarium, and we will talk about these in a little bit more detail. Phentermine and topiramate is a combination medication. Phentermine, you can see, is at the top. Uh, it had already been uh, marketed and approved, and it was combined with topiramate and has been marketed as Cusimia. Lorcaserin, which is a uh, selective serotonin receptor agonist, also uh, was approved in 2012 and has come to market known as Belvique. And again, I'll talk about each of these in turn. Finally, I have in parentheses uh, one of the GLP-1 uh, agonists, liraglutide, which is a long-acting uh, form. It's currently approved, I think as many probably in this room know, for diabetes therapy, but it's been found to have an impressive amount of weight loss associated with it, such 
that uh, it's likely if they've not already uh, put in their paperwork for approval for obesity that uh, NOVA will be doing that shortly. So let's look at each of these just briefly in turn. Uh, Orlistat, as I mentioned already, is a pancreatic lipase inhibitor, so it inhibits the absorption of about 30% of dietary fat. It's dosed uh, TID with meals. It's also now available over the counter market. It is Ali at half of the prescription dose. Uh, patients that are on it need to take a multivitamin for fat-soluble vitamins and also a fair amount of fiber to help decrease the gastrointestinal side effects. Most folks in the obesity field know this sort of as the equivalent of the ant abuse for fat diets. If you have a high-fat diet and you take this drug, you'll be pretty miserable because you'll be experiencing a lot of abdominal cramping, diarrhea, fecal urgency, spotting, a whole bunch of unpleasant stuff uh, that happens at a pretty high rate. So this really helps patients adhere to a low-fat diet. And this is one of the studies from around the time that the drug initially came out in the late 90s, uh, showing that um, Orlistat dosed, uh, let's see if I can get this to come up. So this is a placebo, so all uh, intervention studies by the FDA are required to have a lifestyle intervention arm. So you're looking for the placebo subtracted weight loss. So here is the Nader weight loss for placebo, and here's Orlistat down here, and you can see the difference is about two and a half, maybe three kilograms, which is what's held true over time. So the drug has been available for over uh, nearly 15 years now. Weight loss is about 9% for all long-term trials that include um, a lifestyle intervention. But again, the placebo subtracted weight loss is really only about three to four kilograms more. But despite that, as we already alluded to, this little bit of weight loss has been shown in numerous populations to bring about all those additional benefits of weight loss. So it certainly has a role um, in obesity therapy. Uh, but again, it's not that blockbuster panacea that we would hope for. So let's move on to these other two drugs that have just be recently approved. Um, Fentramine topiramid, again, as I mentioned, marketed is Cusimia by Vivus. It is a combination of Fentramine, which is a sympathomimetic central appetite suppressant. It was already available on the market, just combined with topiramate, which is a sulfamate substituted monosaccharide derivative of defructose. That doesn't really matter so much as that this anticonvulsant medication has been used uh, as an anti-epileptic was found to have uh, weight loss as a side effect. No one really understands exactly the mechanism, but the combination of these two drugs seem to be fairly effective. Uh, the starting dose is uh, fairly low for both drugs. Again, this combination seems to have better efficacy, two drugs targeting perhaps different systems within the body weight regulatory pathways. Um, the cost is about $183 currently for a 30-day supply that was looking at CVS on the uh, web just yesterday. Side effects, dry mouth, palpitations, CNS, and mood effects, and likely teratogenicity. So it's contraindicated, of course, in pregnancy. Also has some effects to increase um, eye pressure, so contraindicated in glaucoma, and then also with uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The two major trials uh, that looked at this drug, the CONQUER trial, had over uh, nearly 2,500 patients that had a BMI between 27 to 45 that had to have at least two comorbidities. Uh, and this was initially published in The Lancet. Uh, the FDA, when they initially reviewed this data, actually voted uh, to not approve the drug in 2010 out of concern for the teratogenicity and the possible cardiovascular and CNS side effects. They required further uh, data from the company. So they uh, then conducted the sequel trial, which was essentially just another year-long extension of the CONQUER trial following individuals over even more, more time. And after reviewing the data from that, the FDA did go ahead and decide to approve the drug last July with a risk uh, management and evaluation plan in place to monitor for side effects. Uh, the recommended starting dose is about the 7.5 uh, milligrams fentramine 46 of topiramate. It's been marketed now uh, for about six months. It's been available just this summer um, more widely at pharmacies that are approved to sell it. It was initially only by mail order because of all of the tracking, data tracking that was required. Um, you can see that the weight loss, the placebo subtracted weight loss is on the order of about um, eight kilograms, uh, which is about seven to eight uh, percent. So it's certainly a little better than Orlistat, uh, but there's been a lot of hesitation, and this drug has not uh, certainly hit its, its benchmarks that I think investors were hoping for just yet. Lorca Sarin is the other new player on the block, marketed as Belvique. Again, it's a selective serotonin receptor agonist. 
Uh, this drug seems to interact with the serotonin receptors located primarily in the brain, so it's thought not, not to have the same cardiovascular side effects as fenfluramine, which is part of that fentermine, the fenfen combination, which was taken off the market in the, in the mid-late 90s. Um, it is, uh, activates likely the POMC uh, pathways in the brain, reducing appetite. It's dosed at 10 milligrams twice a day. With the $75 coupon from the company who's trying to get people to buy this drug, you can get it for about $112 a month. Uh, side effects include headache and dizziness, possibly hallucinations. The DEA has now decided to classify this as a Schedule IV drug that was just decided in December. Uh, there may be some memory loss associated with it. <laughs> Sounding great, isn't it, guys? So, and, and all of this for a relatively low efficacy. So when the Bloom trial, which had over 3,000 participants um, targeting BMI 2745 again, was presented, um, they didn't quite meet the FDA's benchmark for the number of patients achieving a 5% placebo subtracted weight loss. What they were able to show was that more than half of, or excuse me, that double the rates of individuals who were on placebo versus active drug were able to achieve the 5 and the 10%, which is one of the FDA's uh, surrogate um, uh, benchmarks for achieving approval. But in reviewing the data, they still initially voted no in 2010. They wanted to look at this drug in higher risk populations, such as patients with diabetes. So the Bloom Diabetes Trial was uh, just published uh, recently, over 600 patients who had type 2 diabetes. It was shown to be fairly similarly effective in this population. Uh, they also conducted a number of safety analyses. There were concerns that in uh, laboratory rats, there was an increased risk of mammary cancer that looked like uh, it was not um, attributable to the drug. Ultimately, the FDA decided it looked okay and decided to go ahead and prove it, uh, approve it, but they are requiring about six post-marketing studies to be conducted and ongoing by the company once the drug has been released. Um, it's been out and available now just since the summer. It took them about a year to come up with a marketing plan. Uh, and again, it's not really hit its benchmarks, I think, that investors have been hoping for. So just to touch on uh, the GLP-1 uh, pathway, these uh, agents, are used largely for type 2 diabetes. GLP-1 is a cleavage product of proglucagon produced in the distal L cells. Uh, GLP-1 has an effect to uh, decrease um, food intake, stimulate insulin secretion, delay gastric emptying. There are likely central anorectic effects of it as well. Um, and the endogenous form is rapidly cleaved by uh, an enzyme known as DPP-4. I'm going to jump to uh, the agent in particular that's being looked at uh, for its possibility of weight loss. Liraglutide is an analog of GLP-7 uh, through 37. It's dosed by a once da a daily sub-Q injection. And weight loss has been observed in this drug in patients with type 2 diabetes, as well as in individuals without diabetes, either with impaired fasting glucose or even normal glucose tolerance. This is a 20-week study that was published uh, in The Lancet in 2009 with 534 obese patients, a full range of glucose uh, intolerance to normal glucose tolerance. And you can see that at the uh, dose of 3 milligrams, the placebo subtracted weight loss from this drug was about 6 kilograms. Um, the SCALE trial was just released last spring. The data haven't actually been published yet in over 3,500 patients uh, with just obesity, not type 2 diabetes, um, showing similar amounts of weight loss, achieving the benchmarks required for an obesity drug. So it's expected uh, that Novo will be submitting uh, this drug for approval uh, with its indication just for obesity uh, beyond its indication for diabetes. All right, so before we run out and ask for 4,000 packets of these new drugs, there's clearly, I, I heard some of you groaning as I was going through some of these medications, there are, there are clearly issues with these drugs still. Long-term outcome data regarding obesity-associated comorbidities and even mortality are still uh, really unclear. That There's minimal data comparing any of these drugs, certainly at this point. The trials are typically a year. More trials are coming out that are, are with two-year data. There have been a few that are even out as long as four years. And really, none of these currently available drugs, even the, even the better ones, um, even the combination, the, the Cusimia, are really achieving, you know, like a 10% placebo uh, subtracted weight loss, which I think would get more of us excited. So it brings around this question of that complex mechanism of energy balance, uh, that we have central pathways, we have pathways involved in energy expenditure, all these peripheral signals that combined targets, you know, affecting all of these are likely uh, what are going to bring us successful drugs in the future. There are a whole host of agents uh, that have catabolic effects listed there on the left side, both peripheral and central, as well as anabolic agents. And the list of 
potential agents in development uh, is huge. But again, most of these agents have been fraught with safety issues and concerns, and there's not a whole lot coming through the pipeline right now, with the exception possibly of this agent up here known as Bolanarib, which uh, is a methionine aminopeptidase 2 um, antagonist, and it uh, has an impact to uh, increase energy expenditure. Again, it's in early phase one, I think perhaps phase two trials, so nothing really that's um, coming through yet. So that brings us to the, the final portion of the talk. What, what do we have left to offer our patients that's going to have a lasting benefit? Unfortunately, lipo or hiposuction uh, really does not, uh, despite being able to suction off large amounts of subcutaneous fat, uh, really seem to bring about those metabolic uh, long-term benefits that we would hope for. But I think most of you in this room have heard of the concept of bariatric surgery and are aware of the fact that these procedures seem to be incredibly effective at long-term, achieving long-term weight loss uh, in patients that undergo them. And at least uh, from what we can tell uh, with mortality benefits, certainly with some increased risk, uh, but that these, these seem to weigh out favorably. I've put up the four now sort of quote unquote more common, um, the best known of these being the Ruin Y gastric bypass here over on the left, laparoscopic adjustable gastric band. These two procedures are the most commonly uh, conducted currently. Biliopancreatic diversion is still being done, but, but quite uncommonly. Uh, but stemming from the BPD, this new player on the block, the vertical sleeve gastrectomy, is actually one that is uh, increasing in use more and more. In some practices, it's the entire uh, practice. This is the only procedure they do. Uh, I think in Kaiser recent data I've seen suggests that in the last year, about 60% of their procedures are now vertical sleeve gastrectomy. And we'll talk about why that shift may be occurring. So what's the deal about this uh, procedure? Is it really as good for weight loss as we hear? And the answer is it looks like yes. These are data from the largest cohort study that we have, the Swedish obese subject study. These individuals uh, were enrolled. They've been followed now almost out for 20 years, uh, many of them. These are the data from 2007. Uh, following them out to 15 years in terms of outcome. And you can see the total percent uh, body weight loss here, the control group uh, managing to maintain their, their weights fairly effectively for that 15 year period, which is something to be remarked on. But subsequent to that, down in this 20 and even down to 30% range, uh, gastric banding, vertical, gas, uh, vertical banded gastroplasty and gastric bypass really seem to achieve substantial weight loss that's sustained over the long term. Uh, in contrast with what we've seen typically with lifestyle interventions. So that's observational data. What about head-to-head? -head? Do we have any really truly randomized data looking at lifestyle intervention versus bariatric surgery? We have one trial that was published by the group uh, who are lap band fans uh, in Australia, um, uh, O'Brien and Dixon and their group. This was a randomized study of 80 participants that was published in the annals uh, a few years ago now. Uh, 40 patients randomized to a very low calorie diet for 12 weeks, followed by a slightly higher calorie uh, maintenance diet uh, out to 24 months, and then the laparoscopic gastric band. And you can see the differences in weight loss for the first six months. They were able to match the weight loss fairly closely uh, to the band with the very low calorie diet. As soon as that was released, though, the typical weight gain, again, that we see with lifestyle intervention was occurring in that group, whereas in the lap band group, that weight stayed off for that two years duration of the study. That's really the only truly good randomized study that we have for weight loss, looking at lifestyle intervention against us. There are more studies coming out with the diabetes component in that uh, as well, which I'll get to in a moment. So how is bariatric surgery causing weight loss? Well, the two typical ways that we tend to think about this are there are either malabsorptive components to this, so the jejunoileal bypass, which is one of the initial um, bariatric surgeries done, which causes a lot of problems because of intestinal bacterial overgrowth uh, and a variety of issues which actually led to increased mortality. Um, but you can see there's really just a stomach and a little tiny bit of small intestine at the very end there to absorb nutrients from. So this was a highly um, malabsorptive procedure. The biliopancreatic diversion, which is still done, again, also bypasses quite a component of the GI tract, but is not associated with the problems that the jejunoileal bypass uh, has been associated with. And then a slight variation on that, which is known as the BPD uh, with a duodenal switch, which is a, a interposition of different components of the GI tract. So it's clear that weight loss in these procedures is related to some degree to malabsorption. 
The other kind of procedures are these restrictive procedures, and it's very easy to, to sort of look at these and, and understand it uh, just sort of from an intellectual standpoint. You, you see this band around the stomach or the pouch that's left after a gastric bypass. It's tiny. It's less than half a cup. You just can't get a lot of food in there. So it would make sense that without getting a lot of, of food in there, what little bit is there stretches, maybe causes some early satiety and leads to weight loss. So this is a head-to-head -head randomized trial, obviously not blinded because the patients uh, were able to, to know what they get. Uh, but looking at gastric bypass versus gastric band, 250 patients published in the Annals of Surgery just in 2009, BMI of 35 to 60. 111 got uh, laparoscopic gastric bypass, uh, which is the lower line right here. And uh, the other group got the gastric band. And let me point out that although this graph looks small, these guys did what most people don't do in science. They actually have the BMI axis go from 0 to 60. Most of us would have probably shown that 20 to 40, and the difference would have been huge. This is a 5 kilogram per meter square difference sustained out to five years. These procedures have comparable gastric restrictions, so clearly there's something else going on here. So yes, uh, there is gastric restriction, which may lead to early satiety and a decrease in meal size. But you can envision that patients with gastric bypass could simply sit there with a high caloric milkshake, sipping that constantly, and still get in the same amount of calories. But the fact of the matter is the data suggests there are other mechanisms going on. Patients with this procedure report less hunger between meals. They have a decrease in meal frequency. They have a lower intake of calorie-dense food. And again, it's more effective than the equally restrictive gastric banding. So perhaps is there something about the fact that it's not only restrictive, but there's also a little bit of malabsorption. You can see some of the GI tract is bypassed in this procedure. But malabsorption certainly doesn't seem to be clinically significant for the long term, certainly for macronutrients. Uh, there are micronutrient deficiencies with these procedures, but not, not from, a, from a calorie perspective. Dumping syndrome is something uh, that occurs in patients when they eat a high carbohydrate meal. They get all sorts of uh, gastrointestinal upset, cramping, even palpitations, uh, and feel pretty, pretty miserable and tend to eat lower carbohydrate meals because of that. But again, the weight loss does not, with this procedure, doesn't seem to correlate with the degree or severity of dumping. So could it be that there is some other special factor that's uh, being affected, one of these peripheral signals, perhaps, that's impacted by the surgery? Individual uh, researchers have looked at CCK, serotonin, leptin, insulin. None of these seem to be impacted. What about other gut hormones? So I want to uh, just briefly mention ghrelin, which was a, a topic of much of my research through fellowship, along with my mentor at the time, David Cummings. Ghrelin is an enteric uh, peptide that's secreted primarily by the stomach, mostly by the region that's bypassed in the Roux-en-Y gastric bypass. These are all the criteria that lead uh, most individuals to believe that ghrelin really is uh, a hormone involved in body weight regulation. Changes in body weight lead to compensatory changes in ghrelin levels. Ghrelin affects body weight control centers in the brain. When ghrelin is either administered chronically or its levels are blocked, that leads to either an increase or decrease in body weight. So it's not just sort of a meal signaling peptide. And this study was published by David and colleagues right at the time I was coming uh, to the lab. So darn, I didn't get my name on that one. Um, looking at individuals who had undergone Roux and Y gastric bypass, the ghrelin 24-hour profiles are shown here. Normal weight individuals in the dark circle have slightly higher baseline ghrelin levels than obese individuals. But, but weight loss brings about compensatory increases in ghrelin typically. And yet in this case with the gastric bypass, ghrelin levels were absolutely um, suppressed. This has since been replicated by numerous studies, uh, but it's probably not the only factor uh, involved in the success of Roux Y gastric bypass. Um, these procedures also deliver nutrients more rapidly to distal, more distal portions of the gut. So this concept of the ileal break, enteral nutrients exposed to the ileum and colon, decreased gastric motility, decreased gastric emptying, and decreased intestinal transit, as well as decreased food intake. So this is kind of a depiction showing that the nutrients which are entering the stomach and getting down to these more distal portions of the guts more quickly uh, as a result of the bypass procedures could lead to increases, particularly in uh, GLP-1, PYY, and these peptides that are involved in body weight regulation from the gut. I just particularly want to highlight GLP-1, which I previously mentioned is actually uh, agonist to that or being marketed uh, the lyroglutide for weight loss. So this is something that these peptides clearly are able to do. And these data from Carol LaRue's group published in the Annals of Surgery show the exaggerated response 
after a meal in individuals that have undergone uh, Roux and Y gastric bypass in the triangle, those are the really high curves shown uh, both for GLP-1 as well as PYY. Whereas comparable um, weight loss from the gastric band in squares shows no difference from obese or lean control. So there's clearly something about these procedures that are impacting these gastrointestinal peptides. So lower ghrelin, increased PYY, uh, and increased GLP-1, maybe some other factors as well. This is a pattern that's favoring enhanced satiety. It doesn't appear to be overcome by other compensatory mechanisms. The vertical sleeve gastrectomy is the one that's kind of thrown a bit of a wrench into our understanding of all of this. It is a, a procedure that essentially involves removal of about 80% of the stomach, leaving a pouch that's smaller, but still about 150 to 200 milliliters. It also seems to bring about changes in these same peptides, including PYY and GLP-1. There may be some additional components to this story, such as impacts on bile acids, which may have a role in uh, both glucose homeostasis and weight loss. And this is a head-to-head -head trial that was just published now a couple of years ago in the archives of surgery showing that, uh, and these are in Asian participants that had lower BMIs of 25 to 35, they were randomized to either the laparoscopic bypass or vertical sleeve gastrectomy. And they were able to achieve fairly comparable uh, decreases in weight. Those are the dark, both uh, the circle and the square, those are the changes in weight, as well as relatively comparable changes in hemoglobin A1C. So these, met, these, these procedures seem to impact essentially every associated comorbidity of obesity in a favorable way, melting away sleep apnea, improving serum lipids, uh, decreasing the rates of type 2 diabetes. And just in the final moments, I want to touch on some incredible data. This is a field, I think, that's uh, really moving very quickly. Um, there's evidence, a line of evidence that there may be something special going on with the impacts of gastric bypass in particular, and possibly also the vertical sleeve gastrectomy on resolution even of type 2 diabetes. So when individuals undergo these procedures, they clearly lose a lot of weight. And with weight loss comes improvements typically in glucose homeostasis and diabetes. But what was observed early on was that some of patients who were coming in and having these procedures done, their diabetes was essentially resolving. Patients discontinuing use of their diabetes medication with normal glucose control, even before leaving the hospital within a few days. This has been published now in a number of meta-analyses. Bookwald's uh, publication in JAMA is one. Um, in addition, the glucose homeostasis seems to improve more with Wern Y gastric bypass than comparable weight loss, either from other interventions such as uh, the gastric band or even lifestyle interventions. Um, data matching individuals uh, who've undergone a lifestyle change and undergone ruin Y gastric bypass and, and catching them, essentially capturing them with comparable degrees of weight loss and looking at oral glucose tolerance tests, the improvements for the same amount of weight loss and gastric bypass are much, much better. There's an inconsistent correlation between the amount of weight loss and diabetes remission rates after ruin Y gastric bypass, so it doesn't seem, again, all related to the weight loss. And there are also some intestinal bypass operations that improve diabetes without really causing much weight loss. This is something that's being explored uh, even around the world in places where there's not a lot of access to medical care for, for diabetes. So in places such as India, where if surgical procedures might be done uh, when there's less access to medical care, that might be an option. And finally, there's some interesting hints from hyperinsulinemia that ruin my gastric bypass uh, in some patients seems to cause a proliferation of beta cells. So perhaps whatever these magic factors may be are also increasing uh, beta cell mass and improving uh, glucose homeostasis uh, that way. What are the candidates for these factors that may be impacted? So gut hormones such as ghrelin and GLP-1 uh, certainly do seem to play a role in glucose homeostasis. They, they have changes that uh, are in a favorable direction early on that they may be playing a role here. The change in nutrient flow through the GI tract particularly with Ruin Y gastric bypass, suggests there might be some sort of novel pro-diabetes factor in that section of the gut, which when nutrients are taken away from that region, cause this improvement. Uh, the, the sort of challenge to that theory is what's going on then, of course, with the vertical sleeve, because there seem to be similar improvements in that procedure, which doesn't have the same location of bypass. And finally, there may be novel nutrient sensing mechanisms in the gut, which are equally impacted perhaps by both of those kinds of procedures, sort of this gut brain liver neurocircuitry, which is being rapidly um, elucidated. And this area is clearly one in which we need more research uh, and to really look at this prospectively. There have been three randomized controlled trials now, which I've just 
summarized in this slide, two of which were published just in April of last year in the New England Journal. Uh, the Stampede trial is the one in the middle, Phil Schauer and his group. And then just most recently in 2013 in JAMA, all, all of these randomized trials, uh, whether they are randomizing patients to conventional or more intensive medical and lifestyle interventions show a dramatic uh, decrease in diabetes or improvements at least um, with bariatric surgery. But I'll highlight that the outcomes are all different. And as uh, those of us in this field are really working towards a better understanding of this, coming up with uniform definitions of how we might define diabetes resolution, what A1C levels without medications, how long this may last um, is still really uh, an area that we don't know much about. These are the active trials that are currently underway looking at this issue. Buried down near the bottom is the Crossroads trial. Dave Flum, David Cummings, David Ardburn uh, from uh, Group Health, and I've been involved with this trial. Uh, we're working on these data right now, and I think the big push that the NIH would like to see is uh, do we have data that, that should let us revisit the indications for these procedures? This in conjunction with the decrease in mortality uh, have led many to say that it's time for the NIH to really review and revisit their uh, guidelines for bariatric surgery, which uh, are well over 20 years old at this point. Um, currently, individuals with a BMI over 40 or BMI over 35 with comorbidities can uh, access this procedure, and it's mostly approved. Um, but the problem, again, is that we really do need to get these, these randomized trial data to help us understand whether this really is best medical care and whether we should consider dropping the BMI threshold. So I just want to come back to finish up to my uh, patient from clinic. What can I do for him? Again, our overall approach in clinic is to look at the timeline of the weight gain, treatable factors, uh, look at their physical exam, understand whether they have elements of the metabolic syndrome, in quotes, if you will, looking at waist circumference, blood pressure, and other obesity-related issues. Uh, the fasting tests that we tend to get, again, looking for diabetes that may not yet have been diagnosed, dyslipidemia. And finally, we go through the therapies that we have as options. Um, I'm still a big fan of lifestyle change, even though, again, it's not the long-term solution for many patients. It certainly helps, even with uh, small amounts of weight loss. The medications, I think, are fraught with problems. And again, I think the money will be in the bariatric surgery and hopefully identifying targets that we can develop effective pharmacotherapies for. So I think I've hopefully convinced you, if you didn't know already, that obesity is a serious disease. Modest weight gain does have a significant impact on illnesses. And currently, the intensive lifestyle changes are most effective non-surgical way, maybe with the medications again, but there are safety issues there. And again, hopefully, the study of bariatric surgery will help us identify those targets for the future. So just under the wire, with not a whole time left for questions, uh, if there is time, I'm happy to take a few. And thank you for your attention.